please rise for the pledge. Roll call, please. Alderman Here. Alderman Stray. Here. Alderman Kavieski. Here. Alderman Miller. Alderman Rosick. Here. Alderman Shaw. Here. Alderman Ellis. Here. I do want to make a brief announcement before we start with the uh, public hearing. <coughs> the um, um, under plan commission, the uh, two separate agenda items for Casey's um, convenience store are not going to be acted on tonight. Um, they've pulled it till the probably the next meeting, and uh, so there will be no uh, action taken on those two items tonight. Um, <clears throat> also, we will not take public comment on that, and I'll let the city attorney explain why. Our friends in Madison, first of all, I think a lot of you are here to talk about that issue, and I apologize, and I'm not going to be a very popular individual here, but I'm going to blame our, our uh, friends and representatives in Madison um, for my suggestion and my direction and recommendation to the Common Council. What has changed in the last uh, two months is or legislation that essentially says that um, for a conditional use permit, the final determiner of whether it is issued or not is a quasi-judicial body, it acts like a judge. And in order to determine whether or not their actions are appropriate, it has to be based on substantial evidence in a hearing that is before that body. Under our ordinances, the Common Council is the final determiner of whether or not a conditional use permit should be issued. And in conjunction with that, the way this law operates, there needs to be a hearing where evidence is received by this body in, in the form of public comment or um, any submissions from the public, any submissions from the, uh, uh, the entity that wants a conditional use permit. And the Common Council has to be the entity that decides what substantial evidence supports the granting or the denial of the conditional use permit. And so from a standpoint, and, and this is brand new, our ordinances have not caught up to this process because under our ordinances, the public hearing is before the plan commission, but the plan commission doesn't make the final decision on the conditional use. And so, you know, I represent 50 municipalities all over Wisconsin, and we are struggling with how we're gonna retrofit all of our ordinances to deal with this thing that has been handed to us from, from Madison. And so it's my recommendation to the board that or the Common Council that we do not take any public comment tonight on this issue. The, the fear being that let's say that you provide a bunch of information to this Common Council, okay? We gotta go through it again because there has to be a hearing and that will be probably maybe June 5th, maybe June 5th whatever. But w w it would be a do-over. But the, the concern would be that let's say the Common Council listens to all you folks tonight makes a decision on, on the basis of something that's said tonight, denies a conditional use permit, we get sued, and there is um, fodder for you know, the, the entity that gets a conditional use permit saying, hey, you didn't, you, know, you didn't rely on the stuff that was before you on June 5th or you know, whatever date we do it. You relied on something that came in beforehand. It's not part of the record. And therefore, you know, judge, you should overturn it and give us a condition use permit. So I hope you understand it's not the, condi the, the common council's doing, it's not the city's doing. It is a brand new law to Madison. And so I'm highly recommending that we do not, please don't make any public comment on that issue tonight. There will, it will be publicly noticed and everybody will be able to have a full opportunity to address that issue when it comes before us and the Common Council then can hear everything and make a final determination. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. <coughs> okay, now we'll move on with the uh, agenda. Uh, first item is a public hearing. The purpose of the hearing is to hear public comment on vacating all of Rockwell Street between North Lake Road and its termination at Father Lake 
consisting of 15,285 square feet. The vacation will be complete completed because the street is not necessary for public travel and the public interest requires vacating and discontinuance. Mark, you want to give a story on that? Yes, Mayor, I'll just uh, give a couple of brief opening statements here and let the public uh, discuss. So Rockwell Street shown on the uh, screen in front of you, as the Mayor noted, it's about 300 feet long, terminates at Fowler Lake. Uh, the uh, owners of the properties on each side of the street have uh, requested the city to vacate that. They would then construct private driveways of their own to access North Lake Road and because of the fact that the uh, street is never going to extend and, and provide any other public benefit, uh, we are recommending or, you know, we have uh, opted to bring forward the vacation of the street. Thank you, Mark. I'll open it up for questions now. I have cards here, and I'm gonna call the cards that are specifically to the Rockwell Street vacation. Uh, Scott Seafeld. Good evening. I am Father Scott Seafelt, the priest currently serving Zion Episcopal Church on Rockwell Street. Rockwell, as you know, was established in 1889 when George and Williams Streets were vacated as the means to best serve Captain Scudder's cottage and the parish church. This was a time before automobiles and coach buses and tractor trailers, all of which now comfortably use Rockwell and by extension Zion's parking lot as an unofficial city roundabout. This has caused expensive damage to our property and is prematurely aging our lot. Well, it is <coughs> notoriously difficult to get church folk to agree about much. Zion's membership has roundly indicated that we would now be better served by a private driveway off North Lake Road. Rockwell's vacation would also allow our neighbors to put in a private drive as part of their property's restoration plan a plan that has and will hugely improve the aesthetic of our historic isthmus. While we realize that closing Rockwell won't eliminate turnaround traffic altogether, it will help by not inviting it. And that we believe will be a benefit to the entire neighborhood. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, John Siniski. Uh, <coughs> uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on too many occasions, I'm representing Zion, I have had to pick up empty beer cans, empty soda cans, and you name it, that comes from McDonald's. Uh, who leaves this mess behind is a mystery, but um, I'm quite sure that most people realize that uh, we don't like having our private property used as a dump site, uh, whoever that my, uh, individuals might be. I have enough trouble with my on State Street with people throwing stuff out the window, which I in turn go out, pick up, and make sure it gets it thrown in the proper garbage. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Joe Brisk. Good evening. Uh, my wife Catherine and I are the uh, people who bought the unique fixer-upper known as the uh, former Masonic Lodge on uh, Lake Road in Rockwell. Uh, about three and a half years ago, I got the bright idea of uh, trying to convince my wife to turn the Masonic Temple back into a home. Um, she reluctantly agreed. Uh, we subsequently uh, sold our home in New Berlin and, uh, and, and moved our family out here to Oconomowoc. I incented uh, two of my adult children with a little bribery to purchase homes in Oconomowoc. Um, my daughter just graduated from college in January and is now a special ed teacher at Park Lawn Elementary. And she was recently just hired as head coach of the Oconomowoc High School varsity cheer team. So uh, we are committed to Oconomowoc. Um, renovating our home did not go according to plan, uh, but after three and a half years, the interior renovation is finally complete. We love our home, we love uh, our neighbors, we love the city. The one downside is all the unnecessary traffic on Rockwell Street. Um, I've experienced it firsthand for the past 10 months, and it's, it's bad. Um, for example, tonight, um, I, I got home from work, let my dogs out. Somebody couldn't make it all the way to the end of the road to pull in my lot or the church's lot, so they decided to pull into my side yard, and they drove right on the grass 10 feet from my dog and I, and we're, we're just like, where are you going? And uh, I'd like to say that's an aberration, but that, that happens on a daily basis. 
Um, I'm from West Dallas uh, originally, and uh, living in our house is kind of like living across the street from the Wisconsin State Fair Park if the State Fair were year-round and you put a free parking sign in your yard. Um, Zion and us have worked with the city for over two years on this problem. Um, we feel it's in the best interest of the Brisks, Zion, our neighbors, and the city as a whole to vacate Rockwell. Uh, within the month, we are starting on the outside renovation of our home, including uh, reintroduction of the uh, original wraparound porch, which we had approved last week at the Architectural um, Review Committee. Um, if the street is vacated, we'll be returning over a half acre of asphalt back to green space, and we believe this will help uh, make the peninsula and the isthmus a more beautiful place for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on this public hearing? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and move on to regular business. Uh, first item is approval of minutes from the April 17th, 2018 meeting. We need a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions or discussion? That was just, we only had one public hearing. No, I'm sorry. Did you apply for the that's, for, that's for comments. That's uh, afterwards. Okay. That'll come up after we get done with this. That was what that was for. Okay. We'll have public comments on any other subject after we get done here, except Casey's. Okay. <laughs> Can't have that tonight. So we have the we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I'll call the roll, please. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Okay, now we'll go on to public comments, and uh, these are the blue cards that were filled out for other reasons besides the um, the vacation, and um, I, they, they do have a subject on here, so I'll read what the subject is, because I, I know what it is, so I know it's, they're not violating the rules. Um, first person up is uh, Deborah Turner. Good evening. I live in uh, Merchants Platte on LaBelle Avenue, and I am here to um, kind of reinforce. We had a meeting last week with uh, John Kelleher and, and Luke Kowieski and uh, Brian Spencer regarding the ash trees that are marked to come down in our community. And I've been in conversation with the city of Milwaukee, and they have an active inoculation program that's going on that can actually elongate the lives of the trees if they aren't too far gone. Um, I, at this point, uh, I am just asking that um, the city consider looking at this particular program. Its cost is uh, about $70 a tree. Actually, it's about $15 to $18 a tree. If you factor in labor, it can be anywhere up to $70 a tree. It's uh, they do the program every two years, and I know that not all of the trees, there are only 273 trees left in the, our community, and the ash trees with the biomass and the canopies will never be replaced in our lifetime. Um, the city of Milwaukee is, in fact, interested in helping other communities learn how to do the inoculation. We do have two licenses in our community with Parks and Rec or the Forestry Department. Um, I'm prepared to see if maybe uh, we could look at doing Merchants Platte as a test program. And I'm also the president of Greener Oconomowoc, and I'm prepared to write a check for that particular inoculation program. Um, I think that's probably all I have to say in my three minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Spiegelberg. Good evening to all of you. My name is Karen Spiegelberg, and I just want to introduce myself briefly as a declared candidate for District 1 Alderman. There are a lot of exciting and important things going on in Oconomowoc right now for which I would be honored to represent District Number 1 if I'm elected. If any of you have any questions or comments for me, Diane has my contact information. And as always, thanks to all of you for everything you do for this great city. Thank you. Lori Hoffman. Hi, 
Uh, thank you for uh, considering repealing the, uh, the muzzle requirement, part of the breed specific legislation. Um, it's been a long time coming. Um, breed specific legislation started after a 1987 Sports Illustrated article uh, titled Beware of This Dog. It didn't cite any behavior uh, experts, it just uh, had a lot of articles by dog fighters. Um, and so that, that created a wave of panic policy making across the US, amazing. Um, anyways, um, the, the, sorry, I'm not used to speaking in okay. public. Um, That's okay. So that breed specific legislation stood and kind of sat dormant for years. During the last 15 years, um, dog trainers and scientists have learned a lot about dog behavior. Um, and so these, uh, these uh, peer reviewed studies have, uh, have caused a, a backlash and a repeal across the United States starting in about 2014. Um, you'll find small little groups of activists, people that have a personal issue with whatever kind of dog they don't like, that come up with fear mongering, but um, they have no facts. And um, I just want to um, encourage you to uh, repeal all of the breed specific legislation that you have. Um, in 2014, um, that little group of people came to Watertown and tried to enact breed specific legislation and that's how I learned about it. Um, I have two shelter dogs that would have been uh, part of that legislation had it taken, uh, taken place. Um, and I started, I started learning about dogs and legislation and not to bore you with all these details and my poor public speaking skills, but um, uh, one of the things I did was I called Walatosa because they had repealed their breed specific legislation right around the late 90s. And I called the, the city council president and I asked him if there were any problems, how did it go? And he said um, that the dog ordinance must be working because um, for the last five years, they hadn't, the council, his, him as a councilman, hasn't, hasn't had to deal with a uh, single dog issue. I also talked to um, the Wauwatosa Health Department person who was tasked for investigating um, dog bites. And he had also been there for quite some time and said that uh, uh, vicious and dangerous dog ordinance in Wauwatosa has that Wauwatosa has in place works extremely well. There are still dog bite incidences, but the majority of them are with Cocker Spaniels. Um, so um, just in closing, um, I appreciate that you are taking the time to hear this out, and I hope that you will repeal the breed specific legislation completely. Thank you. Uh, Pam Hotterman. Thank you and good evening. I'm also here to speak about uh, breed specific legislation um, and I speak um, from knowledge of my years. I remember back when German Shepherds were the dogs to be feared. I remember when it was then Rottweilers and Doberman Pinschers were the dogs to be feared. Now the dog to be feared isn't even a breed because it's a pit bull and there is no such thing as a pit bull breed. There's American Staffordshire Terriers who are often used as fighting dogs. It's not the dog's fault that they're used to fight. However, I also served as a police officer for 37 years, and I know that in all my years, I was never trained on how to identify a pit bull. Because you really can't. Because people in shelters don't identify correctly as pit bulls. But yet, if a dog has a certain appearance, which is made up from 1% of its DNA, unless they're purebred. So if you have a mutt that happens to look like a big blocky head or something else, that's automatically a pit bull. Well, a pit bull isn't automatically a vicious dog. And what I've learned, and I foster, and I've fostered a lot of dogs, 
and the one who bit me the most, <laughs> and I've never been bitten by my pit bull fosters, but it was a little dog, and he was blind, and he was scared, and he was a Yorkie Terrier, and he bit me like a hundred times. But that was for a reason, and most dogs bite for a reason. Most family pets who are raised as family pets do not bite. Most dogs who are raised as family pets are not vicious. And if you have a vicious dog ordinance, it should address vicious dogs, and there are vicious dogs. And I think you need to have an effective ordinance, and by that I mean you look at what the dog does, how the dog behaves, how the owner cares for the dog, if the dog is running loose, and what the dog is allowed to do. And based on the dog's behavior and the owner's behavior, you control that vicious dog, and that's what makes everyone safe. And one of the biggest things that causes dog bites and problems are the owner's neglect and allowing them to run free and to not properly train them. So I'm here to ask you to be fair to all dogs and to all people with their dogs and to allow dogs that are well behaved and not vicious and not dangerous, no matter what breed they are, to be exempt from the BSL that you currently have. And I just ask you to educate yourself, please, and open your minds and look at the facts of dogs and use that when you're considering your breed-specific legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, can, I, can you have these people tell where they live, please? Because I think it makes a big difference. <coughs> Do you have the address? Um, the lady who just spoke lives at 2130 West Greenwood. The previous woman, 1009 North 2nd Street. Where, where, but what city? I don't know. Doesn't say it's what I city. Well, there's not a North 2nd Street in this town and, and all the other stuff that, you know. I like that, she talked about Watertown, right? I'm from Watertown. And then the last lady said. I'm from Glendale. Where? Glendale. 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 Can we have that information, please? Because it's. Not a problem. Thanks. Or Laura Mausner. Or, I, okay. You want to give your name and address? Yeah, sure. So my name is Dr. Laura Marusanek. I'm not going to be popular here, and that's okay. Um, I'm in P I live in Pewaukee, but I work for Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, so your children are my children. So that's why I'm here today. Um, I have so much to say, and I have so little time, but, and I know I have a lot against me. Um, we're not haters. People say, oh, there's a small minority of people who are haters because we want to protect children and innocent people and pets from what is happening every day in this country. I have so much data. I've emailed the, the group with some of the information. When people talk about facts, we have so many facts. In the last 10 years, there are at least 10 peer-reviewed pediatric medical studies that overwhelmingly show that pit bulls are responsible for at least 50% of all serious and fatal attacks on children. Um, it's also the same for adults, but as a pediatrician, I focus on the risk to children. Um, it, it's, I, I just want to read you a few quotes. Again, I have the studies, and I've, I've emailed you guys with them, and if I'm allowed to leave anything, I do have a list of my references. Um, again, I know this is very emotional. If I saw you guys on the street, we'd be like, hey, what's going on? You know, what's happening? We're not enemies here. We're trying, they're trying to protect their dogs. They love their dogs. I love my dog. My encounter with a pit bull ended in a stabbing, so I can tell you more if you'd like to hear it. But anyways, that's not why I'm here. I'm here because after it happened, I did a lot of medical research. I actually am working with the American Academy of Pediatrics as we speak. I am on the Council of Injury, Violence, and Poison Prevention, and we are actually, thanks to the efforts of myself and other physicians, um, including Dr. Golinko, who um, authored one of the largest pediatric dog bite studies in 2016, which again showed over 50% of the serious attacks were from pit bulls. Is this a coincidence? They just all have bad owners? They just, I don't get it. But anyways, um, so we're working with the American Academy of Pediatrics to take on this subject to try to prevent these fatal and serious attacks on children, specifically by pit bulls and other vicious dogs. Rottweilers are a close second. Um, yes, we care about other dogs. Yes, we know other dogs bite. But pit bulls do some things that no other dogs have done. We talk about, um, you know, Dobermans and Husky or, or German Shepherds, when you look at the numbers and the data and the facts, you brought up facts, the fa over 200 people have been killed by pit bulls in the last six to ten years and maybe that more than any other dog breeds combined in, in history of collecting data, pit bulls have done it 
more than all those other dogs combined. So this is not the same thing. I just wanna read you a quote or two. I know I don't have much time, but I'd be happy to give you as much information. There is a couple of doctors. This other doctor is working with us as well. Um, uh, Dr. Bill Moore, he's um, a surgeon, a plastic surgeon at Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. Based on my experience, I believe that the risk posed by pit bulls is equivalent to a placing a loaded gun with the safety off on the coffee table. I know this is an unpopular stand in some circles. I know, <laughs> not making any friends today. Um, but how many mauled children do we have to see before we realize th the folly of allowing these dogs to exist? Um, another one, one of the studies um, from 2015 said, showed that of the more than eight different breeds identified, one third were caused by pit bull terriers and resulted in the highest risk of consultation, 94%, and had five times the relative rate of surgical intervention. Unlike other breeds, this is the other important thing, pit bulls were relatively more likely to attack an unknown individual and without provocation. Um, and we always hear, it's always, uh, when the kids get attacked, they say, oh, the, the child must have provoked the dog. Well, I think this is my other thing I'd like to say. Um, I had to write some things down because there's so many things. Um, no child should be killed or mauled while being a child. You know, walking on their street, playing in their yard, because someone chose to bring an unsafe and unpredictable dog into their neighborhood without proper safety precautions. Pit bulls are a zero mistake dog. W you know, you say, wait till they're vicious, wait till they attack. Well, one attack can kill a child. Um, I wish Jeff Borchardt was here today. He was going to try to come up. His son Daxton was killed by the nanny's two pit bulls in Milwaukee, um, I think in 2014. And the, the pit bull advocates said maybe he was crying. That was a reason for this attack, and they justified that. Um, or, the, you know, yes, parents should teach their children how to approach dogs, but when it comes to pit bulls, they were bred originally to bait and bulls and bears, to take them down. After that, people bred them over generations to fight other dogs to the death in a pit. Why would we think that these would be safe family pets? They're not nanny dogs. They never were nanny dogs. Again, I feel sorry for the dogs too. I went to, a, to one of the local shelters to look at this situation and you know, 75 plus percent of dogs in the shelters are pit bulls. Um, and they're there for a reason. Many times the aggression shows up at age one or two um, that wasn't recognized before. Um, but I met those dogs and I did, I, they, they broke my heart too. I looked at them and went, you know, this is really sad, but many of them were there because of an aggression, because of an attack. I think that the right of, of your neighbors to be able to play in their yards, to walk to school, to, you know, walk their dogs without the risk of being attacked and killed and severely mauled. I wish I could show you pictures of some of the wonderful people I've met whose children were scalped and brutally mauled, um, and they love to share them because they want to help prevent this too. I know my time is up, but I don't know, I know I've got a tough thing here to try to change people's mind, um, but I wish you would really look at the real facts, um, not people trying to go for the underdog of the day. You know, the media, the pit bull lobby, I did not know this either, is a billion dollar lobby. What other dogs need a billion dollar lobby to say, hey, we're not killers, we're not being vicious and dangerous, bring them into your homes and adopt them. There's just so many other safer dogs. You know, um, again, should they all be put down? Of course not, but if you're gonna own these dogs, you need to follow the precautions and be responsible owner. And that includes muzzling, short leashes, fences. Um, and again, I know I'm not a popular person in some ways, but I spent my career and dedicated my career to the safety of children. Um, and this, you know, we're, we're working with the American Academy of Pediatrics. I personally am working on this project. Um, so you haven't heard the end of it. And I hope you guys, you know, take your citizens um, as important over the minority of loud and vocal people who are going by the, the dog of the, of the year or whatever. So thank you. Sorry I went on so long, but I'm so passionate about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last card I have here is Diane. You want to give your name and address? Diane, I do live in Oconomowoc. Last name, please. Excuse me? Your last name. Weber, and I am. In, I, I do live in Oconomowoc for the last address? 15 years. No, I will not give my address. I don't want people here knowing where I live. You live in the city? I live in the city. I live okay. within a mile and a half of here. I've been to your meetings before. I no, do you not have. Give. I don't. I know. Go ahead. Okay. Um, she's not the only person that feels that way. I am part of a dog therapy team. I also volunteer at Children's Hospital and another Children's Hospital in Austin, Texas. I go around and I visit the children's room. I also do the VA hospital. Um, I would be somebody classified as somebody who is afraid of pit bulls. The difference between a pit bull and a Yorkie is probably none of you will open the jaw of a pit bull if it bites you or anybody you know. 
You are not going to get killed. You're not going to need 300 stitches. Whether it's a Yorkie that bites you or a Cocker Spaniel, you're probably and your child are not going to die from it. The jaw on a pit bull is totally different. Pit bulls, percentage-wise, are the most rescued breed that there is. There are places in this country, and I'll give you an example, Fort Lauderdale Beach. You can walk a dog on Fort Lauderdale Beach. You can't walk a pit bull on Fort Lauderdale Beach. You know, I, and I feel bad for people who, you know, I would never have one. I wouldn't have one. I wouldn't have any big dog anymore with, with children who are this high because the mouth on a dog is the same high. So it doesn't matter if it's a wonderful golden or it's whatever. If you have a two-year-old, you know, and, and they're at that level, and all of a sudden the two-year-old pulls the ear, there's a good chance you're going to get stitches in your child's face. That's just my personal opinion. I see it all the time in the hospital. You know, I, it doesn't matter what I see at Children's Hospital. It's an amazing place, but I would encourage you to not approve um, changing the law so that people with pit bulls do not have to muzzle their dogs. Um, I'm, and when you first, your very first topic that you, before you opened it up to the public, I asked three people around me. I honestly don't know what it was that you tabled until another meeting, so if it's something I want to address here, Bruce, please tell me. No, it's, <coughs> it's Casey's general store. Oh, okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about with that, just briefly, are the two things that were, um, are regarding um, alcohol, whether it's the open or the, um, the malt beverage license for the Economic Area basketball, um, baseball. <coughs> Again, is it really something we have to expose our kids to? Is it not enough alcohol? If you drive down our city at any time in the evening, it is wall-to-wall -wall cars, and they're not sitting in the dress, they're not visiting stores, they're in the bars. There are plenty of places for people to go out and drink. Do they really have to drink in front of their kids at a baseball field? If this was an adult, and you're talking about you know, maybe adults-only baseball field, which That's I don't think is. we have. That's what it is. Adults-only? It's only? adult league. Okay, adult league. So you're only okaying it for the adult leagues? Yes. It's not the location? Okay. It's for yeah. the adult leagues. I would still feel the same way. That's just me. I think there are plenty of places, but that's neither. And what about the, um, the other part that's on here for um, open, open possession of open intoxicants? Yeah. Is in, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that when we have a gathering like on the green, and there's something like the German Fest, they're allowed to serve alcohol, correct? Okay, so when we have a festival in town, there is already a provision allowed for people to be able to buy something on the street. And maybe I'm not, you know, privy to exactly what this is going to. I haven't come to all the meetings. I don't come to that many. I should come to more. But, you know, I think that there's enough alcohol and, and drugs and everything going on in the world that we don't need to open a can of worms to allow even more. People can drink at home, they can drink in restaurants, they can drink bars. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Just come on up. My name is Lyle, and uh, good evening to the council, the police department, the fire, and uh, rescue. Uh, they, do, they do good work. Uh, I walk around the lake a lot, and I notice a lot of things uh, that's happening. And uh, I got a little to the beach. I usually get out the road. You want to pull the microphone up? There you go. Okay. Uh, there, there was a barge there, and there was a truck. There was a truck that backed up into the flooded part it was flooded out there but they were putting those big rocks on on the uh, barge now does anybody know where those rocks are going to go on lake lobel probably make a seawall seawall yeah where Make a seawall, probably. You know, they they use those barges to put piers in and out uh, yeah. on the lakes. The people that can't get their piers in, I would imagine that's what they're probably doing and putting it on the seawall. Yeah. In, in this portion, it's for you to just make comments to us, not ask questions. It's just make comments. It's not to ask questions of the council. Okay. Uh, and this was. Was out of order or what? No, no, you can make a comment on, you asked a question and we can't answer questions. All right. Uh, it, it, 
was any time at all was brought up that they should have or would have a new boat launch for the public and leave that part over there what they have now for the beach people that come in and want to use the beach. Again, you, you make comments of, of what you, you know, don't ask questions, just make comments. This is not a question. Well, you were asking a question about the boat launch. Yeah. Indeed. If you have questions that you want to ask from the city, the, the way to do it is to get on the phone and call the administrator. And she pretty much knows everything that happens around here. It's just uh, we have an open meetings law, and when you approach uh, something that's not on the agenda, um, these folks can't answer it because it will be not something that will be publicly noticed that the general public could uh, be notified that they'd be talking about. So that here again, our friends in Madison kind of tie our hands. Okay, so just call the administrator if you want to ask questions about stuff like uh, is there a public uh, launch planned and that sort of thing. Who is okay. the administrator? Sarah. <laughs> yeah. And you've talked to her before and you've talked to me, so. If you want to wait till afterwards, she'll be right here. All right. Okay. And most of this, uh, most of this, I could talk to someone else. Sure. Yep. Don't have to be up here. No. Nope. Right. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have another comment? I will here. I would like for you to consider, if not for this year, the future, to install some more either regular benches or swing benches along the east side of LaBelle where you currently have one swing and then people fish by the beach and there's a whole section where you could probably put three or four more, some kind of benches to sit on, there's nothing there. So you have one swing one and then you have nothing until you get to the bridge on the east side of LaBelle, Kay. right coming out of town. That's, thank you. Come on up. Just state your name and address and then she'll just write it down. My name is Cliff Radmer. I live in the Prairie Creek, uh, complex behind the Piggly Wiggly. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to address the good doctor's comments here. I've been in Oconomowoc for several years now. Uh, some of you may know me. I do work at a local business here uh, called Freedom Arms Unlimited. Ma'am, when you put a loaded gun on a table, my daughter is sitting right there. She's never once touched a loaded gun in my house because I trained her properly not to. <clears throat> I understand you are an expert in your field, without a doubt. I can't question that whatsoever. My daughter has been around pit bulls. She has been around Rottweilers. She has been on German Shepherds. And she is sitting right there and has never once been bitten. She has been bitten by smaller dogs, a Chihuahua, Cocker Spaniels, but never once by a larger breed. I understand, like I said, the doctor has lots of data to back this up. But when you're around dogs and you train them properly, they behave just like any other person. You train a person to be bad, they're going to be bad. And that's how these pit bulls have been trained to be vicious. But the breed itself is not. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Name and address, please. Sure. My name is Greg Hoffman, and I am from Watertown, Wisconsin, 109 North 2nd Street. Excuse me, I'm not much of a public speaker either. Um, but the doctor did uh, mention uh, the Borkart case that happened down by Kenosha, and unfortunately, a child was killed. I have here in my hand, and I'll be willing to make the available to you, a copy of the police reports from that particular incident. It's uh, about 75 pages long. There are probably at least three police agencies that are contributors to this overall aggregated report, but I've distilled the facts down to three points. Point number one, um, that would be page seven, line seven, report by Detective Michael J. Benazinski, states that the owner of the dogs, which is Susan Ilwicky, she told him afterwards that both dogs together were fed one cup of dog food in the morning and one cup of food in the evening. For dogs of that type and size, this small quantity amounts to a starvation diet. 
essentially one half of a cup of food twice daily for a fairly large dog. This is a best case scenario, okay, best case. If the dogs were fed separately, that's one thing. But if they were fed together, then they become aggressive because they're fighting over scarce quantities of food, okay, builds aggression. And it's likely that the dominant dog would eat most of the food, leaving the other dog even hungrier. Page 21 of the police report. Third paragraph of the report by Deputy Corey Newman. Two inmates at the county jail who apparently knew Borkhart, um, they call him DJ Borkhart because he has a DJ business. Um, basically, they discussed physical and mental abuse by the owners of the dogs. Okay. Third point, page 24, in the third sentence of the fourth paragraph of the report by Deputy Daniel Long, he states that he observed stacked cages of rabbits in the house that the dogs were jumping at while he was waiting, okay? So he was securing the crime scene, they go into the house, stacked cages of rabbits. What are you doing with stacked cages of rabbits? I don't think this is a 4-H display. And no, there's nothing conclusively that says they're training the dogs to be fighting dogs, but the use of bait animals is one of the methods that you use to turn dogs vicious. You have food deprivation. You have potential bait animals. You have starvation. You have buildup of aggression. And I feel bad for the guy because I would, I'd, I would not want to even think about carrying the burden of guilt that he must have dropping his kid off at that daycare, for lack of a better word. I don't know if she is licensed. I sort of doubt it. But in any case, they may not have been training fighting dogs, which is illegal. But that notwithstanding, that is exactly the environment that you would put dogs in to train them to be fighters, OK? It wasn't the dogs. It was the owners and the way they were treating the dogs. They were starving them, giving them potential, what you would think of as bait animals, and making them go against each other for a scarce resource, which is food. That's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. No, you already spoke. We have one, we have one comment. Come on up. Good evening, my name is Michelle Soraki. My address is 6669 South 76th Street in Greendale. Although not being from Oconomowoc, I'm still concerned about the people that live here. Um, I'd actually like to take a little bit of the emotion out of the pit bull topic, if we could, for a second. Um, it's a safety issue. Um, my background is that I've been working with pit bull type dogs for over a decade. I've worked with in excess of 1,500 of them. I've never been bitten. I have worked in the two largest dog fighting busts in United States history, the Missouri 500 of 2009, where 500 fighting dogs were confiscated, and the Alabama 367 in 2013, where 367 fighting dogs were confiscated. Never got bit by any of those dogs. I can speak directly to the Missouri 500, which was the longest fighting line in United States history of over 50 years. That is generation on top of generation on top of generation of breeding only to make animals aggressive. These dogs were housed from July of 2009 through February of 2010. Each dog had three interactions minimum per day by vets, volunteers, and staff. Within that amount of time between July of 2009 and February of 2010, there were two bites from the most vicious pit bull type dogs that should ever have been on this planet. Two bites. Neither of them were life threatening. Not everyone there was trained to work with pit bull type dogs. There were volunteers from all over the country. So I guess, um, I guess I just wanted to just bring a little bit of a different um, perspective. Again, from somebody that's actually worked hands-on, not all pit bulls are great dogs. 
Not all dogs are great dogs. Not all cats are great cats. Animals are animals. I would really urge you to consider just a vicious dog ordinance so that you can protect your citizens from any type of dog that's vicious. If it happens to be a pit bull every single time, okay. But you're at least then protecting your community from other dogs that are potentially vicious as well. And I don't see the harm in doing that. You're still going to protect them from vicious pit bulls, but you're also going to protect them from other vicious type of, of dogs. This is something that's been going on across the country for several years now, where people have been, uh, common councils like yours, have been repealing their breed-specific legislation and placing in vicious dog legislation that covers the gamut. It protects all the children. It protects all the adults from anything that's deemed to be vicious. That's what I would urge you to do. This doesn't have to be a pit bull specific type of matter. You can protect your citizens against all dogs that are a problem in your community. I really hope that you'll consider doing that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to regular business. Uh, first, next item is the consent agenda. Uh, on there we have four items, licenses, resolution granting a six month class B fermented malt beverage license to Conemoke Area Baseball Club for Roosevelt Field. Uh, the electric utility easement agreement between the city of Oconomowoc and Kyle Olson at 430 South Street and the treasurer's report. So we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Your concerns, your questions. Seeing none, call the roll please. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Excuse me, Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Okay, next item is under finance committee. Uh, consider act on resolution for the commitment of Western Lakes Fire District fund balances as required by GASB 54 for 2017 carryovers. We need a motion to act on the resolution. So moved. Second. Laurie. This resolution is for the Western Lakes Fire District and is similar to the carryover resolution that we do annually. This is a carryover resolution authorizing $400,000 of capital improvement funds that were left unspent at the end of 2017 for projects that are ongoing and will be continued into 2018. Thanks, Matt. Lori, do we have any other money left in those funds after this? In the capital project fund, yes, there is a balance, but I didn't bring it with me, Matt. Do you know how much it is by any chance? I no. don't. Okay. That, it was a tough question. I didn't, I didn't bring <laughs> it with me. You weren't expecting it. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Thank you. That's not a fund we control. That's something that uh, the, the fire district controls? No, I think we, can, we, we control it because we're... No, we have, we have to authorize the approval of it. It's their funds. Oh, right. That's true. It's now their funds, but we have to authorize right. it. To be right. Correct. We have to authorize it. Charlie? Yeah, this is money that's already been approved through already the budget. Approved. It, mm -hmm. it was for specific projects. Those projects aren't finished, so it's yep. carrying over the money so they can finish the project. Finish the project right. in 2018. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Anybody else? Seeing none, we have a motion and second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Zwart? Aye. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Okay, next is consider acting a resolution to authorize the Western Lake Fire District to establish a $200,000 biennial revolving line of credit with Exonia Bank. We need a motion to act on the resolution. I so move to act on the resolution. Second. Moved and seconded. Larry? This is the same resolution that we approved last year. Exonia Bank's uh, line of credit for Western Lakes Fire District is to cover any shortfalls that they may have throughout the year cash flow wise. Um, they have not drawn on this before, but because their fund balance is insufficient at this time, we do need to have the backup line of credit in, uh, available to them should they need it. This, the difference between the one we did last year and this year is that this, or this resolution is for two years instead of just the one year that you did last year. Okay. Questions? Seeing none, we have a motion and second on the floor. Call the roll. Alderman Swart? Aye. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. 
Okay, uh, moving on, the next item uh, for the uh, open intoxicants, we are going to postpone that till the next meeting. There's some more work that needs to be done in committee, so that will, the first reading on that will be done um, June, 5th. June 5th. So moving on to item two, consider acting resolution awarding architectural and construction associates services contract for the new public safety facility. We need a motion to uh, act on the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Mark. Thank you, Mayor. Item before you tonight is the hire the architect to uh, do the plans and specification construction management for the conversion of the former Century Store into our new public safety facility. Uh, the city uses a, a, a QBS process when we look for hiring professional. Uh, you want to explain what that? You want to explain what that is? Oh, the QBS. They, yeah, just so the audience knows what you're talking sure. about. Sure. So the QBS is qualification-based selection. And with that process, you obtain submittals from firms that are interested in your project. And you, we, because we're a little bit slightly different, we receive a cost envelope and it's a separate envelope. So the uh, submittals are scored and reviewed by uh, city staff. And in this case, it was a protection and welfare committee. The mayor, city administrator, uh, police chief, and myself uh, reviewed the uh, technical submittals and we provide scores to them. Anyone not receiving at least 80% of the scores is then dropped off and their cost envelope would not be opened and they do not move forward in the process. We did have five submittals and one of them did not meet the minimum. Then we open up the cost envelope. So up until that time, we have no idea what the cost is. And then there's a factor of 20% of the points that is used for that based on the cost. And then in moving forward, because this was a little bit more complex type of a project, we did an interview with the uh, four firms and they were scored on that as well. And the uh, individuals that I mentioned uh, uh, did the interviewing and we are recommending FGM Architects. Uh, they have offices in Milwaukee uh, for doing the project at a cost of $480,000. Thank you. We'll open up for questions. Kevin? Have we used them before? No, we have not, sir. Matt? Yeah, I think the process was really good, Mark. I think we, we ended up with the right group. Um, we spent two million, uh, purchases centuries done, right? Two million, million fifty thousand. Yeah. And we're at 480 for architectural design and construction management. That puts us at 2,530,000. That means we have, according to our budget, $7,470,000 left. Obviously, I want that to be considered as we move forward. And I know I'm on the committee, so obviously it's gonna be a big number that sticks in my head of what we can do to finish that building. And and those numbers were made available to all the firms that had submitted to us. So they're aware of they're what aware budget of number. Asked. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any other comments? Now we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Okay, moving on, consider an act on the City of Waukesha Fire Department Technical Res Rescue Service Contract with the Western Lakes Fire District. We need a motion to act on the, res on the uh, agreement. Moved. Chief. In consideration and action today is the annual Technical Rescue Service Contract with the Waukesha Fire Department. Uh, the contract covers rope rescues, search and rescues and collapsed structures, confined spaces and trench rescues. This is a service that the city of O'Connell, Milwaukee, when they had their own fire department, contracted for for a number of years. It's now with the Western Lakes Fire Department. Since each community has the option to opt out of the service, each community is responsible for their own contract. The city's retainer for the contract is $6,610. It's basically an insurance policy. Uh, you look at the last time when we did not have the coverage and we had to use them to go into a manhole, it cost the city $25,000. Questions? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Swart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Okay, moving on to Planning Commission. Consider acting a resolution vacating all of Rockwell Street between North Lake Road and its termination at Fowler Lake. We need a motion to act on a resolution. So moved. Second. Who is going to give a little 
Is anybody going to give a report on that? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Stay up there. Since you presented it initially. You don't have to turn it back on. Okay. I can Thank see it here. We can yeah, see we it. Have yes, it. The, uh, the council can see it. Uh, the item before you tonight is the vacation on Rockwell Street, as noted earlier. Uh, it's 300 feet in length, terminates at the lake. Uh, there's a church and a private residence on each side of it. They've asked to uh, have the street vacated so that uh, they don't get the unwanted traffic down to there. Uh, the uh, benefit for the city is that we will no longer have to maintain that right away. So there's a savings to the city for that. So it's being recommended the, the, to- The property uh, was also sold to the yes. applicants. And what was the purchase price? It hasn't been sold yet. It, it will be sold. Contingent upon the vacation. Right. Cool. 85,000. Okay. Charlie? Yeah, that was going to be my comment is we had some concerns that the property had value because it did have um, lake, lake frontage. access, yes. lake frontage. And we got um, assessments for that or appraisals for yes. what that would be. And the, the property owner obtained two appraisals and provided those numbers to us. And so we are in a position now where once this is vacated, then it will be sold. Correct. Okay. Yeah, just for the folks that are here, I, I'm in favor of this. Um, I, I think the, the, the purchase of price is good. Um, not having to maintain that in the future is good. I think that was one of the things we early on discussed. And uh, I think the way the plan all came together was, uh, was excellent for the city and for, for Zion and the Brisks. So. Okay. I'm going to echo those comments. Oops, um, I am also for this. However, uh, I have had some conversation with residents on the west side of the street who have some concerns about placement of um, the, the new drive into uh, the church and where and how the driveway conversion for Rockwell will occur. So I, I, while I am for it, I do uh, request that we, we pay attention to that and we don't create uh, a negative situation or opportunity for uh, additional issues uh, with traffic on that west side with the uh, placement of the drives as we move forward. So, yes. Fred Bear. I'm in favor of this, and I think we went about it in a, we followed a good process. We had it appraised, they paid fair market value, and uh, I think it'll be a, a nice addition to having those be private private drives and not have to deal with public traffic. Um, yes, I'm, I'm in favor of this. Unfortunately, we're going to lose a couple of parking spots um, <laughs> that, we, that, that, that we so it's, hardly got in there. It's too far but away from downtown anyway. Oh, so. no, 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 no. And anyway, I talked to Mr. Brisk last night quite extensively on the phone, and um, I had to go to a meeting. I, I went to the meeting and walked in there with still talking on the phone, and about an hour later, somebody said, Anybody got a black car out there? Car's still running. <laughs> 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 so, Joe, you owe me about 20 cents for gas. <laughs> Any other comments? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Swart? Aye. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Okay, the next two items we will be skipping on Casey's. We're going on to old business. Consider act on repealing and recreating ordinance section 12.037A, B, 4, and 4P, 4B of the municipal code pertaining to the restraint of pit bull dogs. This is for its second reading. We need a motion to give the ordinance its second reading. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Open it up for discussion. Any comments? Matt? Yeah, I've, I do have a couple. Um, I, I appreciate the doctor coming out and some of the other folks that also came out to speak on this, whether they're from the area or not. I, I think it's important for us to have some perspective. I, I also think in the entire pit bull discussion, there's a little bit of a gap in reason. The reason the pit bull regulations went in is because they are a different kind of dog. And I think that's what most people believe. Whether it's true or not, I guess we'll leave that to science, right? But there's a reason pit bulls are picked for fighting. It's because they are fighting type dogs. They were originally bred, and here's some facts, which I'm sure some of the folks here know. They originally bred to take down bulls and wild hogs in the wild. Um, 
obviously every dog has a different kind of breed and a different kind of characteristics. Labs were br uh, bred to retrieve. Rat terriers were bred to chase rats out of houses and wood piles. Um, every breed has its slight different characteristics. You know, but I, when I, I hear some of the comments like, well, if a beagle bites you or another type of dog bites you, but it's slightly different, right? And I, I, I would encourage everyone that's against us changing the res regulation to think about if you saw a dog approaching you and it was a beagle and it was aggressive, you'd probably be like, eh, well, it's a beagle, right? But if you see a pit bull aggressive approaching you, it is a different feeling. And I think it, this is a safety regulation. And with all the people that are out here opposed to what we're doing or trying to do or in favor of what we're trying to do, I guess, um, one of the things I, I kept thinking about a lot over the last two weeks since we originally passed the first ordinance was um, what other safety regulations do we have where, you know, hey, look, I'm really comfortable going fast. I've never been in a car wreck. I barely ever get a speeding ticket. Chief, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, but I feel like I'm a very safe driver and I could drive through the city going 40 miles an hour. That doesn't mean I should drive through the city going 40 miles an hour. Um, we have regulation for speed and there's a reason for that, right? Because a lot of people are not safe when they drive. One of the comments I heard was about gun, uh, leaving a loaded gun on the table. And that's an interesting comment from the guy at uh, Freedom Arms. I can train my kid not to pick up a loaded gun, but I can't train my neighbor to train his dog right. I can't train my neighbor's kid to not come into my yard and mess with my pit bull. So there's some differences there in how we're perceiving that. And again, I think there's a gap in some reasoning there. Um, we're not banning them. With all the people that are out here, you'd think we were banning the pit bulls. There are a lot of communities around the country that do ban pit bulls, and we're not one of them. We're just saying, at least what I'm saying, is we need to leave it the way it is and leave these dogs muzzled. Um, a couple other facts, um, which I think are important. Some of these breeds are not even allowed to be brought into other countries like Australia and England. They've been completely banned in some of those countries. There's other type of dogs that are similar to pit bulls that are not allowed to be brought in at all, or they have to be spayed or neutered when they're brought in. Those are facts. Those are from a variety of sources. One of the things I pulled off the internet, and you can't trust everything that's on the internet, but I, I confirmed this. Um, the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia did a five-year study of pit bull bites from April 2001 to December 2005. Actually, it was just dog bites in general for children aged five months to 18 years old. And what they found was that 60% of the bites to children were from pit bull animals. Now, whether that's poor training, whether it's poor environment, I, I don't know what the answer ultimately is. But there's certainly some correlation there with the numbers. And those are, those are the facts. Anyone can bring those off the internet. Um, pit bulls and pit bull mixes are accounting for almost 70% of injuries around the country. And, and that's just the facts. Whether we want to believe it or not, whether we like the dogs or not, um, that's, I, I'm indifferent to that. Um, look, we, we do have, for the folks that are not from the area, we do have a vicious dog regulation in the city. But we also ban wolf dogs, too. But I don't hear anyone here talking about the wolf dog ban. So we, we ban the wolf hybrids. And we're, everyone seems to be okay with that, but they're not okay with the pit bull changes. So I, I think we need some perspective there as well. Um, there are a lot of dog fatalities in the, the United States. And other recent facts, a 2017 study by the CDC said 74% of the last 39 kill, animal related kills in 2017 from dogs, 74% of those were pit bulls. Those, those are facts from the United States government. Why that happened, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that, right? Um, but I'm, I'm here as an alderman to keep my folks and my community safe. And I think keeping the muzzle on will keep them safe. And whether you know, some folks think that's unfair for a dog, I guess I really don't care whether it's fair for the dog. What I care about is whether it's fair for the other people that are in the community. And if that means a couple dogs need to have a muzzle on, I, I guess I'm indifferent to that. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Any other comments? Kevin. Yeah, I was going to keep my mouth shut, but thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Just this last Sunday, I was trying to be very neighborly. And I uh, went over to my neighbor's house, and he had his little dog outside. And I went over to say hello to him. As soon as I sat down, the dog started jumping all over me. No, I didn't mind that. It's a little dog. I'm not too concerned. But then something happened as I 
and got up to leave. He bit me, not just once, but twice. And you would think that the owner would get up and say something to his dog. Now, you don't do that again. A little dog that I could have called the police. I could have deemed that dog vicious and put a muzzle on that dog. Matt, or to anybody for that matter, I've done extensive research. As a matter of fact, I was one of those people that when I inherited this dog, I was a little concerned. I inherited this dog, my pit bull, from my father who passed away. And my concern was aggression. My concern was, is this dog going to kill us? <laughs> When I brought him back from New York, I immediately put him up for sale. And as time went on, I found that the, the way people looked at the dog was not what that dog was all about. That is the, the most gentlest, loyal, dog I've ever had, and I've had quite a few of them. When I walk my dog, and I know some of you have seen me out there, he stays within four feet of me. Never, ever, ever does he try and take over. When I stop, he sits. When I walk, he walks. He loves people. And there's other pit bulls out there that love people. At the end of the day, gentlemen, it is how we bring them up. Now, I'm not discounting the fact that there have been fatalities. There have been bites. And yeah, I understand that. I'm not discounting that. But all I'm asking is one simple thing, that unless that dog, whatever that dog is, in this case we are talking about the pit bull, has done something that that family should not be chastised and have to put on a muzzle on a dog that does not need to be muzzled. Because if that were the case, my neighbor's little can I say it? I'll say it. Shih Tzu should have a muzzle. Bottom line. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut now, but I had to say that. I had to say that. Alderman Charles? Yeah, this ordinance that we're working on tonight is not going to change anything having to do with confinement right. of the pit bulls and how they're, re how they're um, fenced things like that. It's not changing any of the restraints. They still have to ha be restrained by a substantial chain or, chain or leash not exceeding four feet in length. What the only thing that this is doing is taking the muzzle part of that off. The vicious dog part of this still stays in effect and it, it could be for any dog, whether it's a Mastiff, wh whether it's a German Shepherd, if it's deemed vicious, then it gets under another complete set of rules and pit bulls would be subject to that if they're deemed vicious as well. So I'm going to be in favor of changing this and going with the ordinance that we're creating here. Okay. Lou? Uh, I got a couple things uh, in regards to this. One is um, I just want to use this a example to talk about the process. We have um, two readings associated with this particular ordinance. We have two readings um, with all the ordinances, and I, I believe that process um, allows for better debate and better discussion about what we, w what we do for our citizens um, with this body. Um, I originally voted in favor of this um, and, and through 
discovery, through listening to the discussions um, and further thought, I'm actually going to change my position on this. And the reason that I'm changing my position on this isn't because I think pit bulls um, are, are a bad breed. And that, that's been something that's been discussed. And, and I, I believe your pit bull is part of your family and you have, have trained that, that animal um, well. However, uh, as a kid, I was attacked by a pit bull and um, I was relatively fortunate in that I, I got away from that situation without um, extreme harm. However, having four kids, uh, who love dogs and, and have seen, I've trained, or I have taught my, my kids <laughs> not to, <laughs> not to um, uh, approach a dog without asking uh, the owner's permission. However, uh, the younger, younger kids uh, tend to get really excited and they tend to, in some cases, could be perceived as aggressively approach an animal just to pet it and give it some loving. And with the pit bull um, and its bite strength and to compare a pit bull uh, to a, a shih tzu or another smaller breed and the damage that can be done and the time that um, that engagement occurs are, are apples and oranges. Um, and the last thing I would want to do uh, for, for our community is in the open setting where you have a greater opportunity for um, a, a child, not necessarily an adult, because we're going to assume the adult isn't going to over aggressively approach a, a dog to, to pet it or, or not do what they're, they're taught um, in etiquette. Um, and the last thing that I think anybody wants to do is come into a situation where it's not a, it's not a nip um, and even on those smaller uh, breeds, uh, of, of an actual bite won't deface or permanently scar the person who's um, who they're engaged with. So, um, for for those reasons, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna move uh, against this particular ordinance. Eric, um, I'm not in favor of of putting restraints additional restraints beyond the ones that are already there. Um, I believe they have to ha be on a chain in the yard or in a cage. There's, there's a whole laundry list of things that pit bulls are subject to that other dogs aren't. And I believe if you want to take your dog for a walk and you don't feel like it's, it's, it's never bit anybody, it shouldn't be punished and made to walk around with a muzzle on it. I, I just don't think that's right. And I, these types of issues are ones that uh, they bring everybody out. I've gotten emails from California. We've got people from all over southeastern Wisconsin here tonight. And not that many people from our town that came to speak at this. I don't believe there's a, a real big problem with walking your dog without a muzzle. I think if you have it on a four foot chain and, and it's a good dog, there's not gonna be a problem. And I think the owner um, and the dog, there should be repercussions, obviously, if something like that happens. Yeah, but they're already under a bunch of restrictions, and I, I just think it's, it's unnecessary. So I'm going to vote for it. Hey, Stan. Um, if we were to repeal this, where does it leave the city um, as far as the lawsuits? Does it open up the window or the nope. back door? Same as you are right now. Same as you are right now. Sovereignly immune. Sovereign union. There we go. Um, you know, we we raise our kids and we train them to do whatever we possibly can do, and there's no telling what happens to these kids. They can turn bad, right? Because our prisons are full. You ra you raise your dogs and you think you're doing the right thing, and things can go real bad also. So I'm taking the um, uh, there that you know if we can save some kids, and. Um, uh, not worry about uh, the possibility of getting bit by any kind of a creature that um, I'm for saving lives. So I'm going to vote no. Any other comments? Matt? Just one more. The, the vicious dog statute that we do have, um, 
it, it only comes into effect if it's deemed vicious. And it, 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 in the case of a pit bull, sometimes that first bite or first attack may be too late. Um, just a few other minor things to consider. Um, when pit bulls bite, they grind and they tend to bite deep and they grind in order to destroy the sinew and bones of the person they're attacking. These are not normal actions. Uh, Kevin, I, I, I respect what you have to say about your dog, but I, uh, frankly, this isn't about your dog. It sounds like we've, my kids have petted your dog. Your dog's cool, but there are, um, there are problems and it's not necessarily either, I agree with everything Lou said. It's, I'm not saying it's a bad breed, but there are some different propensities and I think that's where the reason has to come in. There are a lot of safety statutes in cities that we simply comply with. Um, you don't swim at City Beach without a lifeguard, or if you do, you're doing it at your own risk. I mean, there's all sorts of safety statutes we have, um, and it's there to prevent the injury. It's there to prevent those things from happening, and that's the best we can do, right, is just try to prevent those things and have some foresight. So that's what I would encourage the council to do, and, and um, depending on how the vote goes, um, encourage the mayor to do as well. <laughs> you know, we did, we did have two people from the community speak, one on both sides, just in, that's kind of interesting. And the way that the council's breaking out right now, it's kind of, you know, so that's just kind of interesting, I think, so. Any other comments? <clears throat> Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Swart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Nay. Alderman Kavieski. Nay. Alderman Rosick. Nay. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Tie vote. Tie vote. <clears throat> Normally we would have another alderman here. Um, <laughs> who's on <laughs> vacation. <two>. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but I do um, respect Alderman Miller, and I know how Alderman Miller voted last time. And Alderman, Alderman Miller voted against it. I listened to, the, to both sides, <clears throat> and I looked at um, what Matt said and what Lou and what Tom said, and it's, it's about public safety. Um, it could happen with any type of dog, but <clears throat> you don't become a vicious dog unless you bite somebody, and I think that's too late. So I'm gonna vote no. Okay. Moving on, new business. Con consider act and resolution approving appointment of official city newspaper for 2018-2019. We need a motion to act on the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. And you wanna give an update on that? Yes, thank you, Mayor. The city received two bids. Uh, I had put out a request for proposal for official city newspaper. We received two bids from the Lake Country Now, uh, which we basically know as the Oconomowoc Focus and the Oconomowoc Enterprise. After reviewing the bids and comparing the costs, um, <coughs> recommending that the city go with the Oconomowoc Enterprise for the uh, official city newspaper for tw the from starting in um, June 1st through of 2018 through June of 2019. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, um, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Uh, next item is consider act on community development investment grant agreement between Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation and the city of Oconomowoc. We need a, we need a motion to act on this agreement. So moved. You have a second? Bob? So I was before you in March talking about uh, moving forward uh, an opportunity or a recommendation of our downtown plan, which was the restoration of the man block building at 102-108 North Main Street um, and requested the authorization from this body to apply for a grant, which was awarded. Uh, before you is the agreement to accept that award. Um, and if you want me to cover both items at the same time, I can do that. Essentially, we applied for a $100,000 grant uh, from the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation um, used in addition to with a $100,000 grant from the city of Oconomowoc for a total project of $425,000 to complete that building. Um, so what I bring before you is first the agreement to be approved uh, to accept those dollars the second resolution that you, you authorized was the indication of a willingness to provide a city grant, and part of that resolution required an agreement 
between the city and Keller Property Investments, who's the owner of the building. Uh, one thing I did want to clarify, uh, as we work through this process, uh, the man block building, as I said, is 102 to 108 North Main. There was a portion of that building that was condoed off, which is 110 North Main Street. So I don't want anybody to, when this project starts, uh, to look at it. There is one structure that exists that is part of that building still, First Wisconsin Financial. We're actually trying to work with them right now to work through our other facade programs to be able to get the rest of the building done as well. So, How big is that, about 15, 20 feet? To um, I want to say that building <coughs> is probably 40 feet wide. The, the, the one, 110? Yeah. 110 is about 40 feet? Okay. Yep. So we have estimates. I'm going to work through our, maybe our facade program and maybe the first bank program to sure. help make that happen while the contractor's there because they obtained quotes after we submitted our grant. So I, I think I voted against this because of the amount of the grant funds to one building. Um, and I went home that night and thought, well, you know, at the end of the day, eh, it's the whole building. We're getting the whole thing done. And then I see this. And, and, and frankly, the way it was presented to us in March, it appeared to me that we were, at least I thought, and maybe I was wrong during that presentation, that we were doing the whole building. And now we're not doing the whole building. So how much more grant money are we going to have to give to the other condo owner for the other quarter or one-fifth of the building? Uh, well, my estimate would be maybe 20000 <laughs> Because it's sixty thousand dollars to do that small piece. Again, I, I'm only wor I was working with the owner of the building, and again, these are right. two separate owners. Right, I understand. Well, we, so, I, and I, I tried to look back in my old files, and I could not for the life of me found the presentation and everything that we looked at. But we, we, I'm, I'm almost sure that we had full pictures of the building, and it, it, it my understanding is we were getting the building done. Okay, and I see it now in the memo that. It, we're, we're missing part of the building, so we're giving a hundred grand. The state's giving a hundred grand, and we're not even getting the whole building done. Um, I was kind of, like I said, after the vote, okay with the hundred grand for the whole building, but now we're not. Now it's 125, maybe 130, maybe 140. Um, I'm going to vote against this again because I, I don't like the I don't like that we're not getting the whole building done, and that's I think different than what we were presented. And maybe that wasn't your fault. Maybe it was just a an oversight on our part. But it, something seems strange there. There's a provision in the grant agreement. It's on page three, sub three, sub D here, secure matching funds. I was unclear on the reading and maybe Stan can help me here. Can he get a grant from us before he secures the matching funds? Like in, in, until he gets a guarantee from a bank? That letter is contingent. I also will note that this is a take it or leave it um, agreement from the state. You either agree to their um, language or or not. Gotcha. It's one well, of those deals. And I actually, I didn't. I wasn't planning on changing anything for for once. Um, but <laughs> I, I'm just curious about the matching. So this is the agreement that the state drafted, or we drafted? The state. Okay. The state drafted. The first one here that I'm looking at. Correct. Right. And so they're saying they want it matching, and if, Stan, your understanding is it's contingent, I'm okay with that. Yeah, it says um, recipient will secure matching funds from non-WBC source if sufficient, da-da-da. And so uh, the release of funds would not happen until that uh, contingency was met. Oh, and that's the, and that's the WE. WDEC, but what about our grant? I mean, I don't want us giving the guy hundred grand, him not getting the financing privately. The state says we're, you're, we're not getting you your one hundred because we don't have the three to one matching per the page three sub three sub D. But we're out the hundred grand. I don't want that Ours to happen. Ours is established through the uh, uh, the two party agreement. The revitalization agreement. Right. I just want to make sure we're covered that we don't we don't write a check out for hundred grand next we, week and no one else does. Agreement has us paying the contractors when the work is actually done. So, you know, the contract's not going to be let until okay. such time as, so we got control over that. And, uh, you know, if every other contingency hasn't been met, we're not writing any checks on the contractor. So the, the exhibits attached to this document, um, 
when you look at Exhibit A and it shows the cutoff of the section where First Wisconsin Financial is, um, is there also four, uh, you know, four part or backside work that's not going to get done then on the backside of the building as well? There is no back uh, wor work on the back of the building. It's on the sides as well as a stair tower, okay. a stair in order to make the third floor accessible. What's the, is, so the backside doesn't need work done or is, is it just? They are know? not doing it as part of this project. There's no windows back there. Most of what they're replacing is cornice windows, replacing the windows that got bricked up on the West Wisconsin side. Um, and again, those drawings that you see actually was what was approved at the Architecture Commission. Right. And does not include the first Wisconsin financial building because that's not what this owner controls. Yeah. Look, I mean, Bob, I, 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 I'm still going to vote against it because I think it's a lot of money for one building owner. We're, we're, we're using tax money um, to um, really give one person a lot of cash. I mean, it's 100 grand for one building, um, and it's not no longer one building. It's now this kind of segregated thing, so we've got two buildings. I, I don't know. I, I'm not happy with how this turned out, so I'm voting against it. Charlie? I've got a couple questions that th this first agreement is between the community development or the uh, WEDC and the city of Oconomowoc. So actually the 100,000 grant that they're giving for this project comes to the city. Correct. And I just want to make sure that the city is protected. If for some reason this project stops, they get part way through it, they spend money and the project stops for some reason, the WEDC is going to expect the city to pay their portion back, correct? Isn't that how I read this? That yep. the city owes the WEDC the money back. Right, and so the way and that that is dealt with, if it stops somewhere in the middle, uh -huh. we don't owe contractors, and that's the way that it is paid for. So but no we would have to pay WEDC back. Now, does this agreement between us and Caliper Property Investments protect us so that they pay us not only our portion that we have granted, but also the WEDC portion. None of these monies go anywhere until the project's done. Until they submit a reimbursement request to us. Right, but they're gonna do that in stages. That's it's correct. It's not gonna be at all correct. at the end. So that there's gonna be draws. Mm -hmm. And correct. if there's a couple draws made and all of a sudden the project stops, what happens with that money that's already been that's a fair drawn? Statement. That's a fair statement. Mm -hmm. does, <clears throat> does their money get spent first? The money that they put up, the 225? We certainly can. Uh, I think that's what we asked for. That's the conversation we've had between the owner and the bank. <coughs> they agree with and then our money first. cycles through as the re reimbursements come through. Because again, we're going to have multiple cycles here because the state isn't going to be able to respond as quickly based on the draw requests of the contract. But there is language in the agreement between us and the recipient that um, the expenditure is in our sole uh, discretion, which would um, indicate that uh, we would require them to put up their money first. Now, if you want to be explicitly you know, laid out in that manner, we certainly can do that. Well, I just wanna make sure that the city's covered so that they not only the property owner would have to pay back the WEDC loan amounts that have already been drawn and that they'd also have to pay any city amounts that have been drawn. Well, the language is the revital revitalization Great expenditure point. shall be used to reimburse Caliber for the actual reasonable expense, uh, reasonable cost of the project. Caliber shall provide all invoices for project work to the city and the city shall pay the actual reasonable cost of the project as determined by the city in its sole discretion within 30 days of receipt of the invoices. Now, if we wanted to make sure we were 100% protected, we would say upon completion of the entire project. And if you, you make that recommendation, we will revise this. They'll have to talk to the contractor. The contractor will have to take the risk that, you know, um, <coughs> you know, I just want have to be done. I, I want to make sure the city is protected. Right. Because in, in, on page seven of this revitalization agreement under section 4.2B, it talks about caliper shall repay an appropriate 
portion of the development incentive to the city, and I'm not sure what that appropriate portion means. That concerns me. I, I <laughs> wanted to pay the it entire portion. It's, uh, I agree. It's, it's a remedy of default. Remedy is a default, page seven, yeah. But we are only going to pay for something that's done. Okay. So, so we're, we're protected. I would that's, say that's my and it has to be, con sorry. That's a good point. In uh, for di just before Article 4, in Section 3.2A, after the bullet points, there will be a revision that basically will say, I'm not going to draft it right now, but it will say right. we are going to pay them upon uh, substantial completion of project as determined in our sole in our sole discretion. Okay. Where the extra bullet point is? Did you already leave an extra bullet point there for that, Stan? I did, absolutely. Perfect. I think he's talking about it. Okay. Great. So, so just to kind of summarize what I'm looking for is we want to pay after they've spent their money. Yes. And if something were to go wrong halfway and that project doesn't get done, we don't, we don't put a cent into it. So you yeah. feel confident in what's in there right now, or would you rather have us maybe postpone oh, this? And no, no, I'm, I, as long as you, I mean, I've heard the comment. Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying, it, it feels like we're kind of mulling this over right now. And can, can, we, can, we do the, the, can we do the first agreement? We could do this one. Yeah. And then we're, postpone. We're still taking comments yeah. here, so. I just have one comment, Bob. Uh, this is the first one we've given 100 grand to, correct? That's correct. And because I got a complaint from somebody that only got 50. <laughs> Well, yeah. we, we've been 50 for yeah. forever. So I just, it's just going to set a precedence for everybody coming forward. So I think we set a precedence because of the location of those two buildings. Correct. It's th those were the cornerstone buildings, that one and the one on the other side. Yeah, this one was. So anybody that's got one on the corner gets 50,000 for one side and then 50 the other. The council set up this fund specifically for three buildings. Okay. And this is one of those three buildings. Okay. We've given no other building owner $50,000. All of our other grants have been $5,000 okay. because they have not been projects in excess of $20,000. Okay. So this is by far the largest project we have ever done. Yeah but it's purely based on the recommendation of our plan of this is also the crown jewel of downtown Wakanda. I, I th this is coming down to two, two parts for me. It's, it's disbursement of funds and then impact on the community for the investment of the grant monies that both the city and the state are participating in. And I think in, in discussion previously, um, the cash out of pocket, uh, by the building owner um, is being looked at as th in, in similar light to the loan that they're taking out through the bank because it becomes their money um, that they have to repay. So um, the, the structure of payout, I think we're having good, di good discussion about and we need to protect those funds associated with this project. There are few projects um, left in that impact area uh, that would have as big of an impact as this particular building and hopefully set uh, the stage for the other buildings that we've identified to finish out our four corners back to historical um, beauty, which is uh, something that we should consider in regards to the amount of money and uh, the allocation of those <coughs> funds is that this building isn't getting those dollars to change the nature of the buildings. They're getting the money to take it back to the historic nature of what that building is and what our community is reflective of. So um, I, I think we should consider uh, all of those things as we are looking to approve this. We've done great things uh, collaboratively, uh, Northeast Corridor Development, where you can't have just one entity driving that project. It's taken the state, the city, and the private entity. And usually when we have that kind of collaboration uh, to get something done, that project moves forward um, and, it, and it becomes uh, a benefit of all. And uh, Derek's comments previously 
where this investment stays in the community. It, if that building sells, that value stays with the building and it stays with the community and it stays on the tax roll. Eric? One other thing I'd like to add is that it won't happen without this. This is our chance to make it happen. Otherwise, that building is in tough shape, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. The cornice is crumbling. Chicken wire holding it's, it's together. Gonna, it's going to look really bad if you let it sit, and I don't know why we wouldn't take this opportunity to invest in that area. We've talked about it before. I know, I know some people don't like to, some of us don't like to give money, that much money away to one property owner, but it is a big project, and it will just sit there right next to those other condo projects that, that are that are part of our TIF district and get worse and worse looking all the time. Matt? Yeah, just a, a few minor things. Um, I agree the value will, the aesthetic value of the building will stay, but the cash value of the building will not. That goes with the owner, whoever owns that building. Now again, it's not a full building, it's two thirds of a building. <laughs> but um, the, the value, we, we're giving that owner $100,000 of value and I think that is a big concern. And, I'm glad we're thinking about it and talking about it, um, and we are giving, we're giving someone that value, and he will at some point walk away, likely with $100,000 more in his pocket someday. You know, housing prices, property values keep going up, so we're giving, we're, we're taking tax money from rental, hotel rentals, or property tax, whatever we're taking it from, and it is going there. I understand the aesthetic value will stay there. To you, Bob, what are we going to do to make sure the other third of the building is going to look the same? Is it, are we going to try to make it look the same as the rest of it? Or is it going to be, you know, are they going to put in white windows? These guys are going to put in black? I mean, what are we going to do to try Again, to And that's a control that? of the architectural commission. Okay. Um, but my understanding, based on the conversation with that separate building owner who called after he heard this got approved, was his intent is to w try to work with the existing architect and contractor to match that other piece. So. Well, I mean, given what we're doing with these guys, we, we need to do everything we can, I suppose, at this point to get the other third of the building done, if that means we give them some additional grant money. But now we are digging more into that, that pot. We, I think we had 175000 in the pot for those three corner buildings. If we give this guy more now, we're digging more into that pot for one building. So it's just something to consider. Um, I think we can prove the first one and then uh, make if those changes. If, if okay. I could tell you, I mean, it's a very simple change on the second agreement. And okay. I'll tell you exactly what it is, and then you decide whether you want to see it in writing. But if you go past that bullet point that's empty, cross yeah. the yeah. bullet point off. Page six, okay. Yeah. Cross the bullet point off. <laughs> I can tell you why that's empty. And the um, next sentence uh, will, at the end, read, City shall pay the actual reasonable cost of the project as determined by the city in its sole discretion within 30 days of substantial completion of the project. That's what it will say. I think that's about it, yeah. That's on the second item, so there's okay. two minutes. Okay. Okay. Why would I use enough vacant bullet points? No. The reason I mean, is because he's not pursuing the city loan program because okay. actually he was able to, he's actually going to, found more competitive financing on his own, so it is purely his own money, and I think he's gonna refinance the purchase of the building at the same time. Good, oh, good. Eric? It's all his obligation. What percentage of the building is it, would you say, that we're not funding with this? Matt says it's a, it's Matt a third Matt says two-thirds, I'm, I'm gonna I'm go just, with Matt. <laughs> I've been going one-third, one-fifth. Yeah, all yeah, right, is it a fifth? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, I'm just saying, it's, it, the, the money-wise, it's it's about a fifth, right? Yeah, I'd say it's right. All right, right. the other thing I wanted to, so bring up is is that we didn't talk about yet is it will increase the value and over time we'll get our money back in taxes it's similar to you know did you vote for the TIF I'm, I'm just at, you know that property owner is going to walk away with another million and a half dollars in their pocket because of the TIF because of the increase in taxes <laughs> it's like a mini TIF think of it that way Matt well though the TIF is but the t I'm sorry I'm calling you that's I I, I I asked him the question. We, He's we, we will capture the increase in value of this property through the TIF. Yes. Because this is part of that TIF district. And I, if you I recall, when I created the TIF district, I also created a fund for future facades, and that's where I believe we will replenish these funds. Yeah. But recapturing tax, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, let, I'm done. Let, let, let's go through. Don, <laughs> did you have something else? Well, I just one thing. I, um, yeah, it is 
going to be a nice building. There's no doubt about that. And uh, uh, the only thing that kind of scares me a little bit that what he actually wants to put on that lower level um, restaurant, that scares me. So. Move to, to what you were speaking to in regards to the TIF um, and, and the, the funds associated with that TIF that were um, thought of for enhancing those particular buildings uh, to increase the TIF district as a whole to achieve our, our goals, that those, those funds have not yet been touched for, uh, and, and I'm asking a question, I'm not making a statement, I believe those funds have not been touched in significant manner for those buildings um, that we're talking about. So we're, we're not talking about um, depleting multiple fund sources, we are talking about the major facade grant program only and not the, the TIF funds um, that are still available within a six block radius and, and whether it's in whole or in part if, if some of them, I'd like to get some clarification on that. In this TIF district, funds will not be generated until we meet our agreement with the developer which says they need to be paid back first based on the incentive reached and then after that time, We've identified a budget that, I, that shows how we can uh, receive funds to be able to provide for things like grants and improvements in the future. If you recall from that TIF right. district, it's about seven and a half years before those incentive payments go through the process. If they go on to the prop property tax roll, we reimburse them 80%, seven and a half years, uh, and then we can recoup costs related to those projects initiatives the city identified were important to them. Okay. Carolyn? There's been many times where I've been at events on the Village Green and stuff where I've had people come up to me and say, why don't you do something about the comic book store? It looks terrible. And I would say the city doesn't own it. There is really nothing we can do until the owner is willing to stick some money into this. This is our chance to actually help do that and do something about that building. Okay. Any other comments? So we're, we have two items here. We're working with the first item now. I have a motion. Is that a motion and a second on mm -hmm. the first item, which is, yes. base, which is the uh, Community Development Investment Grant Agreement between the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation and the City of Oconomowoc. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Swart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Nay. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Excuse me. The next item is consider act on revitalization agreement between the city of Oconomowoc and Caliber and Property Investments LLC. Can I move that as amended by Stan by our city attorney pre in previous discussion? Can we? Okay, I got a question for Stan. Yes. <coughs> Since it was originally distributed unamended, yes. do we have to amend it? No. Okay. Th it's a fine, fine motion. So as amended. As amended. A second act. Did you have you made a motion, Matt? Yes. Okay, as amended. Okay. Any, we all know what is, what's in it. Do we have any comments or questions? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Um, nay. Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Okay, item D, um, we do not have to act on because there will not be a primary, but uh, why don't you state who is, we have two candidates. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Yes, um, as you know, we have the vacant seat for district number one, the alderman seat due to the resignation of Alderman Schmidt. And we had opened up the, um, council did to opened up the filling of that seat by a special election. We've had two candidates, Lynn Stull and Karen Spiegelberg, who filed their candidacy paperwork by 5 p.m. by the deadline today, 5 p.m. So there is no longer, as the mayor said, a need for a primary election in June. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, next item, mayoral appointment to the Western Lakes Fire District Fire Board. I'd like to appoint or reappoint um, Jimmy Hall to the uh, fire board April of 2021 and, and request council, council confirmation. I'll move to confirm that. Second. second. Moving seconded. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Alderman Shaw. Aye. 
I'm sorry. I don't know why. Because you, you, you made me. the motion. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Swart. Aye. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Did he go twice now? <laughs> yeah, that will even up. Passes seven. I was looking at him. Staff reports. <laughs> uh, tonight we get the honor of having Mr. Fry tell us everything about the public Department of Public Works. Black. Tonight. You, you only get a little bit. Only uh, a little bit? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, uh, when I was started to work on my report, I reflected back on some of the reports that uh, some of the fellow department heads had done before me and, and kind of took a cue from Jason Gallo when he stood here and said, hey, I can talk about all these things you always hear me talk about, in my case, streets, or I can talk about things that, you know, maybe you don't hear about that much. So that's where I was going to start. So. When I figured out I couldn't talk about streets, I had nothing. So the first thing I did <laughs> was I went back and I reused a slide from one of my first presentations on public works. We do everything from A to Z, because <coughs> I, I do feel strongly about that. Um, it, it's just a short list, but I did uh, hit every letter of the alphabet on that. And so here's our crew. These are the, uh, the gentlemen that uh, work at the Worthington Street facility. And you know they're the ones that are actually out there doing a lot of the work on the street. Uh, when we get into snow removal situations, we do rely heavily on the other departments of the city to assist us. We have a uh, couple new members of the office staff. Uh, they're on the left. In the back is uh, David Stoiser. He's our new assistant director of public works. And standing in front of him is Brooke Donovan. Uh, she was hired to replace Kathy Buss after she had retired. Um, they both have fit in really, really well, and, and we enjoy having them on our team. So once again, you can't talk about streets, so I'm gonna talk about hours. I'm gonna go through each one of these lines one by one and, <laughs> no, actually I'm not. But uh, <laughs> there's a couple of interesting things that, you know, when I put this together uh, unintentionally, you know, you look at the administrative task allocation at the very bottom, snow and ice. But then when you look on the other side, the other chart on operations and maintenance, and it, it's the number one thing for our crew. So kind of just the difference between the, uh, operations we have but then the other thing that uh, really kind of stuck out on this was developments you know when when we look at the office the administrative side it's one of the leading items on there you know single item now a lot of these other ones you can kind of group together with the streets and but I'm not talking about streets so we'll talk developments <laughs> but uh, Jason Gallo when he was here he was talking about all the work that goes into a development to bring it to you and one of the interesting things is that's only part of the story when it comes to our department because after you get through the first five items, which gets you to the Common Council, you have the rest of the things that we do as a department, taking care of those developments as they go through and, and impact fees, financial security, the permitting, uh, on-site inspection when they're being built, proof rolling of the streets, uh, record drawing, final acceptance, all the way up to the point in a subdivision where they're now issuing building permits. So, um, you know, once the council votes on it, we probably have another year's worth of work that our department puts into that probably something not everybody you know realizes so once again not talking about streets let's talk about animals and I didn't plan on the group tonight so <laughs> um, <laughs> we uh, we're the department that picked up any stray dogs or cats throughout the city we average 42 animals per year picked up uh, we like to uh, try and get them back to the rightful owners right away and so a couple things that we do there um, we'll check them for bed tags or we did have uh, <coughs> company that makes these uh, chip scanners actually donated one to us so that we would have it available so we will check all animals to see if they have a chip and then we there's a couple databases we can go to and get the information and, and get that pet back to its owner which is really our ultimate goal the other things that we use to help us with that is uh, Facebook and website so uh, here's just a picture of one that you know once they've been with us for a few days, we, we advertise, we try to get them adopted, we try to get them claimed, um, anything after about 10 days. We do have to take them in the walks out of the haws because you know we're just a temporary holding facility. So, <coughs> you know, one of the interesting things is in the world of sports, you know, GOAT means greatest of all times. Well, when you work in public works, it means GOAT. <laughs> so this is Waffles. Waffles was uh, one of the uh, non-dog cat pickups that we had last year. Obviously, a little goat. Uh, the interesting thing, too, is that you know one of the things that we have done as a department, uh, based on discussions and safety, was we used to send out two crew people in a pickup truck, find any stray dog, and 
obviously the words ride and retrieve are universal through dog language and generally they jump up in the cab and where you go but now you have a dog that doesn't know you're one of the people in the truck you know could it reach out to you know get scared you know type of a thing so um, working with the police department we take one of their Tahoes that out of their rotation so when they're done with it it comes down to us for a year and then we utilize that vehicle because it has the safeguards in it to help us uh, when we have to go out and pick up animals. He's got tags, that guy. Pardon? He had tags on him. Yeah, he's got an owner. <laughs> uh, one of the other things we do is uh, for the little critters that try to cross the road and don't quite make it, <laughs> we, we go pick them up also. So once again, you know, hey, if you don't let me talk about streets, this is what you're gonna get. So we build things. And you know, probably not a lot of people know that it was our crew that built the arbors that are in the alley. Um, you know, they laid them out, purchased the wood, figured out the design and built them and, and installed them in there. So that's where we dressed that up. The other thing is uh, <coughs> the arbors that have just gone in along the boardwalk. Once again, that was public works crew, uh, got all the material, planned everything. Uh, I thought they did an excellent job. These really, really turned out nice. So mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we rebuilt things better. So on the left and in the background, uh, just to show you how unpopular our oil recycling site was, we couldn't find a picture of it. I had to find one off of an inspection report for a project. But it was uh, just this tank with a little steel roof over it, not very really nice. But so our crew, when we had to redo the parking lot, said, hey, can we build something better? And so that's what we have on the right. So you know, once again, the crew really stepped up and uh, took care of that. <coughs> I like to say we improve things by addition. So when you look at the picture, this was the village green. So this is when we started the project. And just the difference it made having the sod go in. So that's improvement by addition. We improved by subtraction. So it was just one year ago that uh, the former restaurant on the village green uh, was demolished. And seems like it was longer, but looking back, I was surprised to see, see it. So, and at the end of the day, we're able to improve it. So this is the view that we have there today. So once again, I tried, I couldn't make it. I had to do one side of the street, <laughs> Riverwood Trails. It was a great project that uh, we went in and for lower costs than what we've been seeing for a complete reconstruct, able to get an entire subdivision done. So that's it and thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, Mark. Good job. <laughs> that was good. <clears throat> Next is uh, Joe Becker has a award. I'll get to you, Joe. Oh, yours. Good evening. So on May 1st, I had the great opportunity to attend the APPA Technical and Operational Conference and we received two awards from the American Public Power Association. This award here is the Safety of Excellence. It's a first place award for running a very safe and training for certain uh, safety procedures that we do in the electric utility industry. And we are compared against other utilities of the exact same size, but we all only took first place for that. The other award I have is a called the RP3 award here, and it stands for Reliable Public Power. So, some of the things that, uh, there's 300 utilities that overall were given an award. This is, there's three classifications. This is the top honor of the Diamond Award. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of this to save some time. And where is it, there we go. This picture is a picture of me receiving the awards on behalf of the city. I'm very honored to do that for you. Um, on the left there is the statistics that make up the award and how they're broke down by the amount of points. And you don't have to go through them all, but that's all, everything that goes into receiving this RP3 award. And we <coughs> received 99.5 points and the maximum is 100. So we missed 100% by a half a point which is quite an achievement. Well, that so. sounds kind of cybersecurity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I just had a picture that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, I took a crew of three guys with me down there. Uh, there was a national lineman rodeo. They competed. 
uh, in this rodeo with some of the largest municipal utilities in the nation, San Diego, Austin, Texas, Houston, and uh, San Santee Cooper, which is the whole state of South Carolina. And they, they did all right for their first time. Uh, they competed and they received the 45th place out of 65 teams competing. And that's all I have. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, any other staff comments? Uh, reports and comments from Alderman? Go ahead, Derek. Just like to thank Lynn and Karen for running for the seat next to me. I'm looking forward to the campaign and I encourage you guys to go out and meet, meet the residents. It'll, it'll do you good. Also, I was uh, sitting around with some of my neighbors and my kids and leave that picture up there okay. because, uh, because they asked, when, when's the last time we had a street dance where there's a band in the street? They said that's one of the best things they remember about about our town, you know, from growing up, and I don't know when it was, but I guess I would encourage us to maybe do one of those again sometime soon, because. Yeah, that's put on by the chamber or DOBA, usually. It's, but it's, it's, we don't put it on the city. But we could, yeah. we could work, our, you know, yeah, yeah. ask for it. And we see used it. to have it in the parking lot in the back, and then we had it in the street. It's cool when it's yeah. in the street, though. Yeah. It's really neat. Tom? Yeah, um, that back end, Mr. Fry looks wonderful back there along the lake. Um, any plan to put any surveillance back there at all? Because uh, I got a feeling that the chairs might be going in the water. That's why they're uh, bolted down. Not the chairs. Yeah, the chairs, the, the good chairs are bolted down. Those are good? Okay. Not a dollar plastic ones are not. Plastic ones aren't. Plastic right? ones aren't. Oh, yeah. I, I feel so much better. I thought maybe we'd get Grabowski to fish him out with his golf I thing there. <laughs> he's running in every shift. It was well done. I've had so many good compliments on that area back there. It's good. Slow. Um, I'd, I'd just like to make a comment on the uh, Emerald Ash Borer meeting that was uh, conducted uh, by Park and Rec. Um, we had we had decent turnout, and there are a lot of people uh, who who care about our our forestry efforts and the inventory of trees that the city is a steward of. And it was a focus on uh, Merchants Platte, but every district in the city has ash trees associated with it. And um, I, I think as a result of that meeting, uh, the process associated with notification and options associated with um, what the city uh, will, will do moving forward was, was impacted. So. I, I just can't say um, enough positive things for the departments that step up and, and prepare for those meetings to provide the information uh, to our, our citizens outside of these walls. I think it, the, the change in venue is, is positive and more engaging uh, with the community. And um, I, I think we'll hopefully do more of that. And I think uh, as a result, uh, we'll get more uh, community involvement. And I was encouraged to hear uh, during one of the public comments that potentially uh, Greener Economy Walk will have some funds associated with doing a pilot project. Um, all of that is, is a, a result of community engagement. So um, I can't wait to see how that uh, continues to move forward. Okay. Matt. Yeah, at last meeting I mentioned a couple things out by my area and um, I'm pleased to say that the pit near Starbucks is already being filled, so the developers have, have stepped in the right direction there. I thank Jason for helping me, you know, kind of make that happen. And then we're still working on the big, huge nuisance rock pile on the edge of our development, but I, I think we're, we're going to make progress there. The only comment I ought to have about is the ash borer thing. Um, I think we should save them if we can, but, you know, bear in mind, we're, you know, it could be an ongoing expense as well. And... You know, if we, we the, the sooner we rip them down that are bad and replant, the sooner those trees will be back for future generations. So, you know, th there's got to be a nice compromise there. So, you know, someday those trees will be back. We just got to replant them, you know. Sure. Any other comments? Uh, do 
reports and comments from the mayor. Just like to commend the uh, two ladies for taking out papers. It's uh, it's going to be a challenge for you, but I hope you do have luck. And if you have any questions, you want to stop in and talk, um, check in and check in with uh, the administrator, and we'd be glad to help. Any questions you might have? Um, I have no more comments. Uh, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>